Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Kirk Stephenson, Miranda Janelle, That Charlie Dude, and Steve Remington. On this episode of DTNS, who liked your latest post and should that be public information? X is trying to find out. Plus, Samsung's latest requirement for repair shops is a bit of a head scratcher. And when is an AIPC really an AIPC, or at least the one you think you're buying? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, May 23rd, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Well, thanks for being with us today, everyone. Um, <laughs> from from foggy, overcast Los Angeles, uh, although Columbus, Ohio is, sh- is shining bright onto Rob. Uh, but uh, without further ado, let's talk tech news, starting with the quick hits. Now, we don't always cover outages on DTNS. In fact, we rarely do, but this was a pretty big one this morning. A massive Microsoft outage affecting Bing.com, Copilot for web and mobile, Copilot in Windows, and ChatGPT Internet Search, and also DuckDuckGo started around 3 a.m. Eastern on Thursday, primarily affecting users in Asia and Europe. At least that's what the users were reporting. Now, other reports said that opening Bing.com showed users a blank page or a 429 HTTP code error, but Bing search was still working directly. ChatGPT Internet Search and DuckDuckGo had problems too, and they used Bing's API, which was probably all a related issue. Microsoft confirmed that users not being able to access the Microsoft Copilot service uh, was true in a post on X. In a later update, the company added that it continues to isolate the root cause and transitioning requests to alternate service components to expedite service recovery. On the strength of AI-driven sales surge, NVIDIA shares passed $1,000 per share for the first time. The chipmaker reported its first quarter earnings, which beat analyst expectations on Wednesday, skyrocketing the stock in after-hours trading. They also announced a 10 to 1 shot stock split, which probably didn't hurt much either. Net income for the quarter ending April 28th was $14.88 billion or $5.98 per share, compared with $2.04 billion or $0.82 per share in the same period a year ago. Revenue was $26.04 billion versus $24.65 billion expected, and earnings per share were $6.12 adjusted versus $5.59 adjusted. The social media startup and ex-competitor Blue Sky has officially launched direct messaging on the platform. This actually happened on Wednesday. In an announcement, which you might have gotten if you're a Blue Sky member in your uh, inbox, the company says it plans to fully support end-to-end encrypted messages down the line. Blue Sky teased that it would be introducing DMs two weeks ago, so made good on that promise. Up until now, all conversations on the platform have been public. So the launch of DMs allows users to chat privately and still be on a social network. Google Pay will offer card perks, buy now, pay later options, and fill in user card details using biometrics or a PIN. The updates will capitalize on integrations with other Google products like Android and the Chrome browser and are designed to enhance the customer experience of using Google Pay to make it a more competitive option against other payment methods. OpenAI has reportedly struck a five-year, $250 million deal with News Corp. That owns The Wall Street Journal, Market Watch, The Sun, and more than a dozen other publishing brands. The deal will let ChatGPT display news from these publications and then use the data to further train OpenAI's AI models. News Corp CEO Robert Thompson, Thompson reportedly said in a memo to employees that the pact acknowledges that there is a premium for premium journalism. All right, Rob, let's talk about what's going on at repair shops and why we should be uh, not exactly pleased. Well, 404 Media obtained a leaked Samsung contract that requires independent repair shops in exchange for selling them parts to give Samsung the name, contact information, phone identifier, and customer complaint details of everyone who gets their phone repaired at these shops. 
but it gets worse. Samsung also requires these shops, many of not who are independent or many, I should say, who are independent to, and I quote, immediately disassemble all products that are created or assembled out of comprised or, or I should say out of compromised or that contain service parts that are not purchased from Samsung. So they're essentially telling repair shops that if a customer brings in a device to get repaired for one thing and they have a part that is not a Samsung part, they got to take that phone apart or take that tablet apart or whatever the case is. And it's not, it's not great. It's not great. Yeah, so you might be saying, how could Samsung possibly, or why would Samsung do this? John Bergmayer, legal director of the Consumer Rights Group Public Knowledge, says, quote, Presumably, Samsung would try to defend the provision about service parts not purchased from Samsung, requiring a phone to be destroyed as a measure to fight counterfeits. Might be true, but uh, it's going to get Samsung into hot water in a lot of other cases. The contract shows uh, a lot of control that Samsung has over independent repair shops, which need to sign this agreement to even get repair parts from Samsung. So the shops have to basically just agree to this the, you know, the legal agreement. Um, this is not new. This, this happens at repair shops. But signing this contract does not even make a repair shop an authorized repair center. That's a distinction that requires shop owners to jump through more hoops, to, to agree to other things. Okay, so Rob, I've got a Samsung phone. This is, you know, hypothetical. Uh, something's wrong with it. I go into a repair shop. The repair shop opens it up, says, huh, that's weird. This battery shouldn't be in this phone. You must have gotten it from a third party. Then they confiscate my phone? I, when, when I initially read this uh, this article, I, I had the picture in my mind that you know, I, I got my you know my, my charging port fixed, or as you say, I, I got a new battery and it wasn't an official Samsung part. But now my screen is broken. I want to get an official screen. I take it in, and they say, "Hey, sorry," but they pull out a ball peen hammer and then destroy my phone right there in front of me. That is what I took this as. Now I don't know that it's going to be as nefarious as that. But it can't be much worse if they're saying that you, you are contracted and obligated by said contract to disassemble any phone that comes to you from a customer that is not using official parts. That is super, super de uh problematic from 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 my standpoint, because I'm thinking that these are independent shops. Who's going to cover them when they get sued all kind of ways uh, right. you know, from the, the owners? Like, you know, I, I'm thinking of I buy a secondhand phone. I may have no idea that that phone may have a re replacement battery in it. My screen cracks. I take it to a place to get fixed and then I don't get a phone back, l you know, let alone get a phone that doesn't have a battery. I don't get a phone back. That is problematic for these shops all kind of ways from from where I'm sitting. Well, yeah, because, uh, you know, even if, even if uh, it is repairable now, I, as the customer who have some third party battery that, you know, yeah, either either I knew what I was doing or I didn't doesn't really matter. Um, you know, maybe I'm getting something else fixed, like you said. Now I have to be, you know, narked on, you know, from the repair shop back yeah. to Samsung so that like I am known as a person who did something weird. Um, and if the repair shop sides with me and says, you know, she's just said, you know, <laughs> she's a nice lady who just wants her phone fixed. We're just going to do this under the table. Then, then they're liable. Um, that's how I'm reading this. And that is bonkers. That's yeah, bonkers so, crazy. So it, it is crazy. And there's other things. So independent repair shops must purchase Samsung parts only. They are very limited in the types of repairs they can do. So they can't do any soldering on the board. And this one is kind of kind of nuts as well. Repair shops must get certified by WISE. Now, WISE is an arm of CTIA, a trade group that's comprised of like Verizon and T-Mobile and AT&T and other companies that ultimately are lobbying against right to repair. So you have to get these shops have to pay for a license. Um, or a certification from an organization that actively lobbies against them doing the thing that they're actually doing. Um, this is wrong all kind of ways. And what is really interesting is that if you are in a state that does have a right to repair law, none of this is valid. Hmm. Hmm. So yeah, it's, th this one is, is, is weird. It's uh, I, I can't say that I've heard anything like this because I'm, I'm really thinking of it like this. Even if you bought a battery that was a counterfeit battery, uh -huh. does that give 
Samsung the right to confiscate that battery. I, I don't know that that's the case. Also, um, I mean, what is a counterfeit battery? You know, right. it's like, you know, I mean, that is like the I I mean, there's there's nothing sort of like blingy about, you know, something within a uh, a device. I mean, a smartphone or otherwise that might come into it or a repair shop like, yes, I can see where Samsung could make the argument. Hey, we've got counterfeit problems and this is how we're going to go about trying to eradicate them. But you're going to get a lot of people in the mix that are not, you know, in any way part of any sort of like pushing counterfeit culture or, you know, or, or even have any idea that this is this is part of something that they're trying to get fixed. Yeah, if, if you take a phone that's working maybe with a cracked screen to a repair shop and then you leave with a bricked phone because they were contracted to do so by by Samsung, that's going to be very problematic. But in unrelated news, but maybe related, iFixit and Samsung are ending their two year relationship after falling or I should say after failing to renegotiate a new contract. iFixit CEO and co-founder Kyle Wines told The Verge that Samsung does not seem interested in enabling repair at scale. He believes dropping Samsung shouldn't actually affect iFixit customers all that much instead of being Samsung's partner on genuine parts and approved repair manuals, iFixit will simply go it alone the same way it's always done with Apple iPhones. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, probably related. <laughs> Unrelated story on the surface? Probably related. Um, well, if you are an X premium user, I am not, but you might be, you've already had the option to hide the post that you like since last September. On Tuesday, the director, uh, a director of engineering at X, Wang Haofei, posted that the platform is going to make likes private, noting that public likes may be discouraging people from engaging with content that could be considered edgy or they don't agree with. Wang also said that soon you'll be able to like without worrying who might see it. So that sounds like the company is going to take likes private, um, not meaning that if Rob posts something and I like it that that isn't shown, the number count would still be shown, but not the fact that I liked it. Uh, head of X, Elon Musk, uh, for, uh, formerly revealed a long-term plan to hide likes and repost counts on the timeline. So that's just, if you're looking at the timeline itself, you don't see that information uh, creating what he says is a cleaner experience that only shows the view count. And then likes and repost info would be available if you click on the actual post. Meaning, if you if you don't care all that much, then you're just scrolling anyway. If you do care... That information is, uh, you know, on the second screen, so to speak. But this is different. This would be something that uh, other social networks have been exper uh, experimenting with over time. I know a lot of people sort of prefer the like, who cares who else liked this? You know, it, you, you know, someone posts something, you post it because you think it's uh, either, you know, informational, educational, entertaining, or you know, newsworthy or whatever out into the world and who whoever likes it and responds to it great but this also could uh potentially have a lot of people feel as though they can they can like uh content that they don't want everyone to know that they like I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think like there's so many different ways we can look at this. Rob, what what are your reactions? I see both good and bad to this. So there, a true thing is that there's a lot of places on the internet that people can only express themselves if they do so anonymously because it may be against the law. It may be against the rules that you know that you know there there are some pretty uh, you know pretty strict rules on what you can say in certain countries compared to our freedom of speech that we have here in the United States. Um, so I can understand why they would want to do something like this. I also see the other side of it is that the Internet in many ways can be a cesspool. And if you give people the ability to like stuff anonymously, uh, it can become a little bit more cesspool. -y. Uh, you know, it, you know, so I, I see both sides of it. I can see where if you simply are, are concerned about something coming back on you, you could never like because it can be tracked back to you and your account. But if now you can hide that. You're going to get people just liking all kinds of things. Um, you may get bots liking all kinds of things and promoting things up and maybe making something that shouldn't necessarily be shown in an algorithm shown more often just because of the number of likes that something has received. I, I Go see, ahead, you know, if, if you take away the morality uh, uh, around some of this debate and you just look at it, in a way it, it perversely kind of 
takes away the value from using a platform like X. If you don't have like, oh, look, Madonna liked my post with my, you know, hand-woven handbag that I did over the weekend, that post suddenly doesn't have as much interest because a bunch of randos liked it up. Big deal. Sure, yeah. Right? It, and you don't influencers have, are also likers. Yeah. And, and, and those tastemakers don't have that validation and other people don't see it as important because someone they know or they see as a, a, an important uh, trendsetter or tastemaker or, or uh, um, you know, voice of, of political, you know, uh, sage, uh, sageism, it's, it's no longer there. And so, you know, it, I mean, I understand that you can, you can like, still like things normally, but at the same time, like, what value does it really add other than liking, like, if no one knows you liked it, what does it matter if you liked it? Well, okay. So over the weekend and who, uh, who they were doesn't matter, but there was a story about a celebrity, a married, married celebrity couple. And, and one half of that couple liked kind of a, a, a post on Instagram that was about, you know, breaking up. And so it was like, Ooh, looks like they're headed, you know, they're on the skids, you know? And I'm sort of like, okay, well that's either intentional so that we all talk about it. Or, you know, the, the celebrity stuff is kind of in its own bucket, right? But uh, to like something like that doesn't necessarily mean I agree with what you say. The like is a very, you know, it's a, it's a pretty arbitrary thing. It's, you know, on Twitter, it, it, you know, back, back in the early days uh, of your, it used to be called a fave. And then it was sort of like, well, it's not a favorite. It's more of just, you know, a thumbs up. So, you know, Twitter eventually changed to like, which is still what it is. But the whole kind of like, I agree with you or I'm giving you accolades or just kind of like keep keep on keeping on type stuff. There, There's a lot of nuance. And I, yeah, the, the whole sort of like, I want to like stuff that other people might not agree with. It's like, do I, do I really want to do that? And just sort of hope that they never find out it was me. That sounds like a lot of work. Citizens of the internet generally take every opportunity to read more into things that <laughs> have nothing to be read more into. So because of that, sometimes, you know, you, it's, it's a life choice. If I like this, how is this going to come back and affect me? So if I could just like it and you can't tell that I liked it because I want to see the account go up because I thought something was clever. Or I thought something was funny, but I don't want to have to explain my choice to the internet. I can understand why people want to do things somewhat anonymously in this way. Yep. Well, want a recap of the week's tech headlines with insights into how technology affects and disaffects communities of color? Then check out The Tech John, where host Rob Dunwood, that's me, Stephanie Humphrey, and Terrence Gaines dive into the top tech stories of the week delivered from points of view you don't always hear in mainstream media. New episodes land Tuesday afternoons. Find it wherever you get your podcast or visit thetechjohn.com. That's thetechjawn.com. <laughs> All right. Earlier in the show, we 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 posed the question: What is an AI PC? Well, it kind of depends on who you ask, especially in 2024. PC World's Chris Hoffman wrote in a post Thursday that though Microsoft just announced a new wave of Copilot Plus PCs with AI features that use the Neural Processing Unit or NPU uh, hardware built into the PC's hardware for super-powered AI experiences, and talked about all sorts of good stuff including recall, which you might not think is good, but, you know, this is something that would take advantage of the NPU. There are going to be some limitations. Namely, if you bought an AI-enabled PC with an NPU already in 2024, it might not be getting these new features. That includes AI PCs with Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA hardware, because some of them simply don't meet Microsoft's latest hardware requirements for Windows 11's big AI features. Some of these laptops even have a Microsoft Copilot key on the keyboard. So, you know, you might be confused. And I, you know, you certainly couldn't be blamed for that. Microsoft's Copilot Plus PC certification is what's needed for new Windows uh, 11. So that, you need that, and a neural processing unit or MPU with at least 40 trillion operations per second. TOPS tops that run the AI models, six gigs of RAM, 16 rather gigs of RAM and 256 gigs of storage. Also to make room for the AI models, also a requirement. That last part, not a huge deal, but uh, Roger, I know you were looking into this this morning. It does 
it does sound like you're going to have a lot of confused people saying, well, what did I buy this AI PC for? So it, it's it's going to elicit confusion, and that diffusion will eventually turn to anger because a lot of people were trying to uh, future-proof by buying these so-called AI PCs. And one of the issues with the way Copilot P plus PC works is it's a very it's it's not that it has a very strict certification. Is that there's only one currently existing device on the market that meets it, and that's the Qualcomm uh, chip that will be powering all these Surface uh, laptops and and partner uh, laptops uh, that integrate uh, the this ARM uh, processor into it. And so what you're going to have is a bunch of people who are confused because they thought they were getting some level of AI. And even if Microsoft allows them some level of, uh, of AI, it's going to get very confusing fast. So wait, I don't get the recall feature, even though some other stuff is AI powered. Um, and, and, and furthermore, you know, like 95% of the Windows market runs on x86. So if you're expecting people to wholesale, just say, all right, I'm just going to go spend more money on new hardware because nothing I have meets these requirements, uh, I think you get a lot of blowback. Two, GPUs like NVIDIA uh, from NVIDIA and AMD do offer the ability to process and sometimes uh, at least for, at 40, uh, 40 tops or greater but the specification is it has to be that MPU has to be integrated into the the chip itself, uh, and furthermore, even my uh, Apple's M4 system on the chip, the one they just released or announced, uh, doesn't meet that requirement. It's at 38 million uh, uh, or 38 trillion or 38 tops tr operations per second. So. I don't know if this is a way to kind of shoehorn people into the Qualcomm uh, ARM platform that Microsoft is desperately hoping catches on, uh, or if this is a genuine, this is a requirement for it, uh, then why wouldn't you be able to allow uh, non-integrated devices like GPUs or even third-party uh, NPUs that can be inserted as a PCIe card into you, into a desktop PC uh, allowing that functionality. Why does it have to be integrated? Is it for security? Is it for functionality? Is it for control? Is it for all of these things? It's kind of confusing. So Microsoft might have forgot right fast that a great number of uh, PCs that are purchased are not purchased by individuals who decide, oh, Microsoft's got that new hotness. Let me go get it today. And they literally get it in the next month, two or three. They're purchased in fleets or by the thousands by big giant companies like insurance companies and hospital systems and, you know, you know, in manufacturing companies that literally have thousands, if not tens of thousands of employees working there and they do a refresh that they didn't plan, you know, a month or two or three before they did it. They planned it two years before they did it. So there are a lot of organizations who just got a lot of these AI PCs. I'm doing the AI and quotes for people who can't see right now. AI PCs because they thought that that is what was going to be AI PC as far as Microsoft was concerned. This new 40 terror, you know, you know, you know, terror operations or 40, you know, trillion operations per second is relatively new. So you're going to have big manufacturers like, you know, the, the Dells and the Lenovo's and, or, or, you know, or, or the, the IBM's, basically the big companies, HP's that are making, uh, you know, computers for, you know, for fleets are making them for, for industry. They simply are just not going to care. And they're like, Microsoft, who do you think that is, you know, who do you think is being called first? You or us when it comes to getting our hardware, we're called first. So we're going to advertise what we have until those companies start ordering what you have two, three years from now for what they, you know, they start ordering now for what they want to do two, three years from now. This feels like, and yeah, I mean, in the uh, corporate sector, this is going to be a headache of, of different proportions, but you know, a, a real marketing weird situation. If I go into Best Buy and, you know, let's say that I, you know, I don't know the story. I don't really know what I'm doing. I just, you know, maybe want to get a, a, a new laptop for myself or maybe my kid. And, uh, you know, it's AI power. Oh, okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Oh, price is right. Yeah. Sound, okay. I got it. And then, you know, it turns into like, oh, no, not that kind. I'm trying to liken this to something else that 
has bamboozled people in the past where it's just, it's supposed to, you know, it says it does something, but it's like, Oh, but not maybe I guess kind of like, (laughs) kind of like Wi-Fi or 5g, right? Like, Oh yeah, no, not that kind of 5g. It's just more like in a way. And and this is the thing. I I don't necessarily put all the blame on Microsoft. I put, put it on the industry, right? The, the whole kind of, um, you know, AI PC was kind of a marketing thing from the beginning. That was like, hey, we have, you know, Intel, AMD, we have these new CPUs rolling out with integrated NPUs. How do we market? How do we sell it? Um, and so there's a lot of confusion, but I don't necessarily think that uh, Microsoft's approach will be all that helpful. I mean, it will be, it, it will, it, I mean, it's very impressive technology, um, but it does remind me of way back when, when CD ROMs were a, a, a unique and, and uh, a, like new shiny thing on PCs. And Microsoft really wanted to spur the adoption of CD ROMs, CD ROM software, because, you know, they were selling a lot of CD ROM. Uh, applica- uh, applications and, and software suites on CD-ROM, and they came up with a thing called MPC or Multimedia PC Standards. So people could buy a PC knowing that it would work with this software. So they had MPC uh, Level 1, MPC Level 2. It got very confusing to the point at which time no one cared. Like it became a meaning meaningless word. Um, if Google ever gets its act together and they decide to to really kind of hone it hone in on this rather large opening uh, that I see uh, happening right here. They could say, "Hey, we're going to offer you uh, our, a bundle of of suites, uh, including uh, Gemini local the local Gemini on your hardware. Um, you don't need to have anything specific, but you will need one of our Tensor processing units. But you can get that as an add on card that you can install yourself or via USB." Um, and it'll all be keyed, so there'll be a security uh, a lock on it. Uh, but the the key would be, um, you don't you don't need to buy a whole new machine. You can just up buy this one one hundred dollar two hundred dollar piece that you can add on, and you'll have your AI functionality. You'll have eighty percent of what Microsoft offers, and that's the eighty percent you really care about. Recall as cool as it is. I I wouldn't necessarily find that the most compelling reason to to upgrade. If it was AI, help me do a workflow or build up my spreadsheet so I don't have to wait t- waste ten hours on it. That's more compelling. Yeah, I I don't think that uh, you know from a who's purchasing standpoint, this is going to make a lot of difference because I don't think consumers are going in buying PCs. Well, I I need to do AI on my PC, so it has to be a Copilot Plus PC. I don't think they think of it that way. And I know that organ that corporations are not thinking of it that way. Corporations think, can I run this program? Can I run that program that helps us get our business done? And if the answers are yes to that, then that's the hardware that they get. So I think Roger, you're right because PCs are something that generally lasts five to seven, eight years or more in, in the home. If you can go get a card, that you spend, you know, you spend two hundred dollars on. That's going to extend the life of something that you already have. That's doing everything that you already did just fine. But now you get these new AI features. I think that this could be a miss for Microsoft, and I wonder if they will go back and reevaluate this whole marketing pitch that they've just done. Well, uh, while you evaluate whether or not you're going to buy uh, a new AI PC, you might also be considering going on a cruise. If so, and you're having a difficult time deciding what's the best cruise, where is it going, when is it uh, taken off and, 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 and coming back to shore, worry not. Chris Christensen has you covered. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. I've got a website that isn't going to win any awards for its design. In fact, this is definitely one of those the 90s have called and they want their website back. But the site is cruisetimetables.com. And it can be a quite useful site if you want to know, for instance, what cruises go to particular ports or when cruises go to particular ports. You might be trying to avoid cruises or you might be trying to get someplace in particular this is the website for you. I was trying to find out, for instance, which cruises go to Dakar, Senegal, which may not be what you're going to be searching for. But the website, again, is cruisetimetables.com, a useful, if ugly, website. And this is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Hey, you know, sometimes ugly websites still do still do their thing. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Rob, we also got some feedback about Microsoft's uh, AI powered service recall, which seems to have struck a nerve. Absolutely. So Jason, Jason wrote, when I first heard about recall, I was outraged, but lacked the wherewithal at the time to express why it struck me. The anger isn't about the feature. It's about the lack of trust that Microsoft will respect my choice and not change it behind my back. Widgets using edge instead of the default browser. I turned off the display of apps on my windows 11 lock screen and this month's patch Tuesday enabled the setting again. OneDrive is known for silently enabling folders uh, backup and it after it's been disabled. So it's not that the feature is bad. It's just that I don't trust that if I disable it, the Microsoft will keep it disabled. Yeah. You know, uh, I wholeheartedly trust, trust of a company that is, yeah. I, I mean, arguably the biggest part of this. Um, and I, we, we got, we got some other feedback from folks um, and thanks to everybody um, who, who wrote in about this. Um, yeah. Uh, some echoing uh, Jason sentiments that, it's not so much that it's a bad feature, it's that it's Microsoft. And we just don't think that Microsoft has the track record to have a feature like this and have people sort of blindly say, okay, yeah, record my screen. Yeah, you know, poet Angela Milo said uh, said this best. When somebody shows you who they are, believe them the first time. And Microsoft has a history of repeatedly turning things off that people very specifically turn, you know, uh, or turning things on that very specifically people turn off. And that's that's just a trust issue that uh, I, I don't know that I would want this on ever, but I want to make sure that if it's off, that it never comes on. Yep. Well, patrons, uh, you should stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Uh, you know what to do. Uh, another day, another twist in the OpenAI Scarlett Johansson saga. Boy, it just is relentless, but we'll fill you in. You can also catch the live show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com for Sath Live. We'll be back tomorrow discussing the negative impact AI could have on the climate with Allison Sheridan and Lynn Peralta. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>